thank you for joining me on another episode of She Leads Now podcast, where we help career and entrepreneurial women gain the tools to develop a success mindset, create winning strategies, build collaborative relationships, and take bold action towards creating impact and fulfillment in their lives and careers. I'm your host, Sabine Gideon, and I'm on a mission to awaken and activate women and emerging leaders so they can tap into their innate leadership ability, elevate their influence, and create the impact they were destined to make. If you're ready to up-level your confidence, courage, and influence, you've come to the right place. Join me weekly for insights, strategies, and resources to help you grow, develop, and embody the leader you were meant to be so that you can make the impact you know you are called to make and establish the legacy you've always dreamed. The world eagerly awaits the emergence of your brilliance, impact, and influence. So with that, let's dive into this week's episode. Hello, and welcome to another episode of She Leads Now. I'm your host, Sabine Gideon, and I am so excited to be here with another amazing guest for our Lead Hership Reloaded series. And so this series is really focused on redefining, reimagining, and rehumanizing leadership in a post-pandemic era. And I have the lovely Miss Ann Sullivan to join in the conversation, share her insights, share some of the impact that she's been making throughout her career as an entrepreneur. But before we get into that, just want to share a little about her real quick and has held executive level HR roles and organizational development and learning and development roles with PepsiCo, Callaway Golf, and Life Technologies. Anne's clients not only engage her for technical competence, but also value her thought leadership and business acumen. Clients appreciate her ability to think strategically as well as tactically about practical, sustainable, measurable, and scalable solutions for talent acquisition and development, leadership and management development, and performance and workforce engagement and retention. With that, welcome to the show, Anne. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Absolutely. So you have a lot under your belt, a lot of expertise in the space of HR across the multiple disciplines. But before you got there, tell us a little bit about your career journey and what led to you transitioning and becoming an entrepreneur. Okay, that's a great question. So I started out my career actually on the learning and org development side of HR. And I often describe that as the rainbows, puppies, and kittens side of HR because everything, you know, and everyone has potential and all you need is the right training and the right intervention and the right coaching. And I took that perspective. I ended up at the request of a chief people officer I worked with to round myself out. I decided I really needed to understand more of the human resources side of things. So as an example, I'd be teaching things on leadership development, and then something would come up about a problem employee and all the hurdles that people had to jump through to manage someone out. And I'm like, wow, I just don't really understand all the ins and outs, whether it's the legal side or the processes. I really need to go deeper on this and and truly understand it. So he put me in a field HR position in the Southeast. I had 1,300 PepsiCo-owned restaurants that were fast food And let me tell you, I went from rainbows, puppies, and kittens (laughs) to snakes and eels and just an underbelly experience of employee relations. And every day, literally every day was a fire that you had to fight. Very serious issues. I mean, everything truly from the end of murders and rapes and robberies and terrible things that happen sometimes in restaurants, especially when you have 1,300 of them theft, you name it, right? All the way up to how do I manage somebody out? So I did finally get the answer to that question, but it was a heck of a way to get there. So after about a year in that role, the organization actually moved away from a specialist focus and went to a generalist focus because all of the employee relations managers were developing a hundred yard stare. We were pretty jaded. We pretty much believed all people were terrible and were lying to us because our lives were all about investigating and responding to terrible things. So the generalist perspective was super helpful because now, you know, I'm over not only training again, I also have talent acquisition, management development, and then you have some of the more traditional HR things. So it balanced me out again. 
And then you asked, how did I end up consulting? Well, post PepsiCo, I had some other leadership positions, but I also got married and I had my first child. And I was working for an organization that was just super fast paced. You moved at the speed of light and easily after having a baby, I was doing 90 hours a week, seven days a week. Yeah, that's not compatible with motherhood. And I was part of the generation that was raised as you can just have it all. It's all about balance and quality time. And boy, were we sold a whole bill of goods. (laughs) Nothing in my life was working. My marriage was not working great. We weren't on the rocks, but it was like we were getting into pissing contests over who had more time to go to the grocery store. That is not a good discussion to be having in your marriage. So I realized that that wasn't going to work for me. And I ended up leaving that organization, but taking them with me as my first client. My boss at the time was understanding and supportive of what I was trying to do. And he could tell I was just really in a lot of pain over leaving my child every day and not seeing her. I'd come home and she was already asleep. That just did not work for me. So I d- I'd like to tell you that I had some incredible strategic plan three to five years out, looked at my business, thought about what I would do. But the reality is I gave notice and was lucky enough to have someone that believed in me and let me take them as my first client. That is awesome. And so tell us a little bit more about what you do in your business as a consultant today. Okay. Well, it is across that whole spectrum that I initially talked about in terms of the career experience that I had with PepsiCo. That was over an eight-year period. I would say it was the most formative stage in my career. PepsiCo is known for, and they were known for this way before it was fashionable to say, HR has a seat at the table. We really had a seat at the table. Your operations leaders sat at the head of the table with finance to their right and HR to their left. And it was more than an equal voice, but you had to be there prepared with your data, with your facts. You couldn't just say, hey, let's go do this because it's nice for people. I mean, you had to talk about the impact on the business and the turnover and the metrics and the scorecards. And you had to know your stuff, I guess Mm -hmm. is what I'm saying. I definitely bucked the advice that I got. You know, I got a lot of advice from other entrepreneurs that said, you know, what you really need to do is really specialize, you know, really focus on something, become the best in class in that and become known for that. And I'm like, I got to eat. And so I never specialized in all the years I've been doing this. And so if you spoke to some clients and you said, hey, what does Anne do for you? What is her, her area of expertise? They'd say, oh, she's amazing at talent acquisition. She came in here. She assessed our talent processes from top to bottom. She helped us not only on basics like compliance, where we had a lot of holes. She also put together some incredible processes. We now have a very strong selection process for these positions. And then across the organization, we've done this. We revamped how our recruiting is organized. We balanced workloads among the recruiters. Um, And we really took a strong look at, right, the whole candidate experience. And we feel like we're best in class there. So yeah, that's what, boy, does she know that space. And then you would talk to someone else and they'd say, well, she's developed these online and in-person programs for us over the years in these areas. And it's usually related to soft skills, but there's also some other things like I've worked on compensation demystifying compensation for other organizations where it's a little bit more technical and there's a blend of those skills where you're teaching a technical thing, but then how do you apply that and talking to an employee? Mm -hmm. And then you might talk to someone else. I'm becoming licensed in investigations. And when I do that kind of work for internal investigations, I have to work under a PI. So I'm actually an employee in those circumstances. So if you talk to someone else about what I do, they might say that I do internal investigations. When I work as a PI, I have to be under someone else's employment to do that. I can't be consulting because of licensure requirements in California. But all of that feeds everything. I take what I learned from an investigation and I might apply that when I'm doing my next training program because I know how badly things can go. And now I know what do I want to really emphasize when I'm helping build a leader's capability around certain skills? If it's managing someone out, what are the things that you really need to watch out for? Yeah. So, yeah. So not taking that advice was probably the best thing I did, just following my instincts, which were don't specialize, stay broad. And that variety, by the way, is what keeps me going. If I only did any one of the things that I just mentioned, which is just a small 
sampling of what I do, I think I would have been really bored really quickly. Yeah. Yeah. You make a lot of really great points there, especially, you know, in the corporate world, they want you to be a generalist, right? They want you to have the knowledge and skill because they're paying for one person to have this ability. And then in entrepreneurship, it's usually like the messaging is you got to niche down, you got to niche down because when you're talking to everyone, you're talking to no one, right? And so there are a lot of conflicting messages around who and how you have to show up to be successful in either place. So I'm glad that you found that thing that works for you. And clearly it's been working because you've been able to build your practice over the last several years. Like your kids are grown now and yeah. you're still, you're still in this place and have a really great reputation amongst your, your clients around your versatility and your ability to change hats. So kudos to you for that. So thinking Mm -hmm. through kind of the landscape that we're in right now under the context of lead hership reloaded and what that looks like and what that entails, I am not shy of sharing my views that there is an absence, there is a void of true leadership at every sector in our society, right? From the tippity top to, I don't know, in the homes and in the communities. I feel like the space is still there. The void still exists. Women still have the opportunity, yet I don't necessarily see the drive. So with that, with all of that, I'm just curious, based on your experiences, obviously your network, talking to other women entrepreneurs, what are some of the challenges that we all know exist? that were, that are not mainstream, that we're not talking about that maybe perhaps we can start to have a dialogue around how to fix some of these challenges that currently exist and then make a way so that future leaders don't have to fight the same battles. Wow. That's such a, that's a big question. And I love the question. I could attack it from like a million different angles, honestly. At a hundred thousand feet, I would say that all movements, right, have a huge momentum. And then there's this sort of moment where people feel like, well, we talked about it, right? And we've done some things and maybe in our organization, we put in a few things, maybe it's a mentorship program. They feel like they've checked enough boxes. And so that kind of gets faded to the background. And then meanwhile, people are like, wait, there's more work to be done. There's systematic things here. So, so I think it's attention span. I think it's other priorities. And I think it's just the natural cycle, how things go. But to your point, that doesn't mean that we have to then take a step back because women are still expected to show up a certain way. There's the double standard and it still exists. If we say, I want the seat at the table and, and we're insistent on that we use those words. It's, well, she's a pushy old broad or fill in your other favorite word, or she's difficult, right? She's demanding. Who does she think she is? So sometimes I think most women that I talk to, even in this more enlightened generation that is, I think, doing a great job of of trying to push past some of the barriers, we find ourselves, most women I talk to, we're in a meeting and we're waiting for that opportunity to jump in there. We have assessed it. We have some ideas. We want to put some things on the table that are recommendations or maybe we already have thought about this and we came prepared. We find that opening, we say something and it's, it's almost not acknowledged. And then like two minutes later, some guy pipes up with what we just said and everyone's like, oh, and you're just like, are you kidding me? So then what do you do? Do you say, hey, I'm just going to use a name, Jim. Hey, Jim, thanks for supporting my idea. There's a lot of systematic endemic kinds of things. So I do think we have to advocate for ourselves and for each other. There, there aren't any easy answers, but I think we, you just, you have to, in spite of push forward and finding your way. Absolutely. And so you, you touched on a couple of things here, especially the labels, right. That we get labeled and others perceptions. And I've been doing this podcast now for since January. And I always ask the question around, if you can go back to, and I'm going to ask you this at some point too, but if you could go back to your younger self, what feedback would you give her? What advice would you give her that would totally change the game? And I would say about 60% of the responses from well-established women at this stage in their life is that I would go back and tell her that it's okay to be her or that it's okay to speak up or yeah. that she has a voice. And it's just like, 
it's all of these things that felt very constrictive and just you can't be you even as adults, right? We're still in the space of, do I have permission to speak up? Do I have permission to advocate for myself? Will that be perceived in a negative way? And it's just, it's mind boggling. I mean, I do it myself, so I totally get it. The question is at what point, or better yet, whose whose permission are we still looking for at this point? Who are we waiting to give us permission to own our identities as leaders, own the spaces that we've been put in to advocate for ourselves, right? Regardless of what the negative impact or the feedback is. Hey there, stopping by to interrupt your day for just a few minutes to share an amazing and exciting announcement with you. I will be hosting a three-day workshop titled Elevate Your Leadership. November 28th through the 30th. And this workshop will take place live via Zoom every single day. This workshop has been designed specifically for ambitious, impact-driven women in leadership who wanna elevate their leadership to the highest level possible and show up as the best version of themselves in every single area of their life. This three-day workshop will help you completely transform into the powerful, effective leader you already are and give you the confidence and the clarity that you need to take the next steps in your life and in your career. I'll be sharing more information about this during the next few weeks. In the meantime, you can always go to my website at sabinegideon.com slash elevate. Again, that's sabinegideon.com slash elevate to learn more and to register. Talk to you soon. And so I'm curious, in, in this case, you're your own boss, right? Yes. And in many ways, obviously your clients, you're working with them through partnership, but how do you navigate as the person who is being brought in as the expert, the subject matter expert to figure all these things. And then you're put in these environments sometimes where like you have to prove that you're the expert. Like how are you managing those in the moment? And what have you put in place to ensure that, you know, that inner voice in you doesn't convince you to cower in those moments, but to actually stand up and own the space that you've been given? What a fabulous question. You asked really good questions. (laughs) So something that as you were talking, I was thinking a little bit about is that you have to, whether you're inside of a company and you're an employee or you're outside of a company and you're supposed to be the, the expert, if you will. Every time I come into a situation like that, I'm bringing that entrepreneurial I have a set of expertise that I'm bringing to the situation. If I don't believe that, then I probably shouldn't be showing up as a consultant. One of the, when we talked about all the different areas that I've been able to make an impact on, I actually have the credibility there to be able to do all of those things plus others. So I've earned that right to sit at that table. I may not have all the answers, but I am willing to find out. I'm willing to listen and collaborate with my clients. I that last night I was working with some clients for planning an offsite board retreat. That's their first one. A lot of consultants might approach that as, well, I have the expertise. Here's your agenda. I never approach things like that. I just don't. I do have the expertise. I do have the experience. What I knew that they needed was a straw dog to tear apart, right? So I put something together and we had our Zoom meeting. And I mean, they tore it apart. I mean, if you have any pride of authorship here, like your feelings are going to be hurt so badly. But it was great dialogue, right? Because I was able to help them understand the value of doing a pre-retreat survey to have that data and to kick it off with that data and then shape the agenda around what we learn. So rather than worrying so much about what does our agenda look through three weeks from now, let's get the data first because that's going to inform the agenda. And so. Yeah. So I enter it humbly, if you will, right. I still have that mindset that I have much to learn. They're going to give me insights in the organization and what's important to them. But if I feel they're going too far afield, I'm going to push back using PepsiCo language in the nicest way possible. And so that lets me influence and impact and shape. And that is the secret when you're in one of those meetings and people are talking over you. And it's like, you need to show up authentically and say, I bring a certain amount of expertise. Now, if you don't, 
then you should, frankly, zip your lip, ask good questions, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Or ask the questions afterwards if you want to show up as the person who doesn't know what's going on. But, you know, you definitely, if you have ideas and expertise in something, then you need to come in there and say, I owe this organization, just as I do as a consultant, I owe them the truth about what it is that I'm hearing and saying and what my expertise is. And if I don't do that, I am not doing my job. Mm -hmm. They are free to choose whatever they want. But I owe them, if they're signing my paycheck, I do actually owe them the truth. Yeah. One of the reasons I took to consulting like a deck to water as I look back on all of that is that I am a teller of truth. And sometimes in organizations, that isn't always valued. Now, in fairness, younger me, if I could go back (laughs) and give her a little bit of advice, is that sometimes there are more effective ways to get the truth across than to come up and just slap someone across the face with it. That's, that is, by the way, a very valuable skill set at times, because mm-hmm. there are moments where you have to put someone back in their place because they are so over the line and you do need to assert yourself. But most of the time, you don't need to go to that moment or to that extreme. There are things such as taking your, I call taking your loyalty oath, you put the big L up, not for loser, but loyalty oath and say, you said something and it got dismissed, Right you can go lick your wounds or you can listen to more of the dialogue and find that opening again and say, can I just raise something here? You do ask for permission, right? Cause you don't want to come across as that, you know what, mm-hmm. and just say, I'm hearing this. I'm hearing that is our goal to deliver X or is our goal to solve for Y. And the reason I'm asking that is that some of the solutions I'm hearing, while they're great ideas, they don't really get at this. So how do we do that? And like you help reframe, again, it's consultative. You reframe the conversation. So you take a role without being the leader, right? Of asking important questions. And I have some ideas around this. I did mention this, but let me tell you why I think it's going to get us there. You, again, you step up and you give your expertise. And if it, by the way, if it keeps getting shut down, either you're with the wrong client or you're with the wrong organization, Or you need, in some cases, people do need to go ask for feedback and say, you were, hey, boss, if you have a good boss, we don't always, but, you know, a mentor, hey, mentor, hey, boss, hey, peer that I trust. I'm really frustrated by what happened in that meeting. I was bringing my expertise. I was trying to shape the conversation and it fell flat. What do I need to do to become more effective in that situation? I wish I'd known that question, right? When I was in my twenties and starting my career and asking for feedback more often, I was afraid of feedback. Because I, to me, it was always like, oh, this is where the boss tells you everything that's wrong with you. But that was usually how it was done in all fairness. Like my perception was reality. But part yeah. of leadership is you owe people that feedback on how to become even more effective. And if you do frame it that way, they're going to be more receptive. But if you're younger in your career, and even if you're older, but especially when you're younger, find those bosses, find someone who's truly in your corner or you develop that relationship where they are, whether they're inside or outside of your organization or all of it, constantly asking for feedback, not being needy, right? But when something doesn't go well or something did go well, asking like, what is it that I need to work on to become even more effective in this situation? I've led lots of people and I found that the employees who came to me and asked something along those lines, even if they just said, hey, do you have any feedback for me? So much easier to give them that career developing boost than the people that, you know, you're like, Hey, I have a couple of observations I'd like to share with you that I think you become even more effective. And it's, if they're already shutting down because yeah. they're of that, then it's like, they're the tougher ones, right. To deal with. Even if you hear something you don't like, you can take that feedback. It's a gift, right? And sometimes you get gifts and it's like, you pull it out and you look at it and it's like, well, this is a scratchy old sweater and I don't like the color and I don't think it fits. And I think it looks terrible on me. Or you can re-gift it. People re-gift feedback all the time. I can't tell you how many times I'll be working with the client and I'll make a recommendation and then it'll come out like a week later that they told all their direct reports, the exact feedback I gave them. I'm like, wow, way to re-gift it. Whether it applied <laughs> or not, they just paid it forward. Okay. Going back to something that you said in the beginning or a couple of things that you said in the beginning that essentially the way that you've approached being in rooms where you had a seat at the table and exerting your subject matter expertise that really came down to, and this is me summarizing, coming from a place of belief, coming from our like self-belief and the ability that you have coming from a place of confidence and certainly from a place of curiosity. 
to understand what it is that the other person or the other people are trying to achieve and helping them either figure that out or helping them come to a solution that would do that. And so the theme between all three of those, right, it has nothing to do with external, right? That right. was That's all internal. And I know it, it takes us time to mature and to develop more time that we're in this environment. But I do think essentially the things that make us powerful, the things that allow us to show up as great leaders have nothing to do with the external. It all starts like what's happening between your ears. It all starts with what you believe about yourself and how that shows up and how people receive that. So as you're thinking about, or as you think about the leaders that you support today, leaders that you've been supporting over the last couple of years, we know that there is a shifting right in the demographics. I think it's like 43 or 47% of millennials, like in the workforce, like they are dominating right now. Baby Mm -hmm. boomers are about like 25%. Gen Z is about 5%. They're coming in heavy and hard. Actually, most of them aren't going into the traditional work environments, but they're still entering the workforce. As you think about leaders today, and not just leaders who are leading women, but leaders who are leading those who are coming into their leadership identity, whether it be in, in by role, whether it just be in terms of their level of confidence, what is the shift that current leaders need to make in terms of how they groom, how they develop, how they speak to, and also in, in, to some extent, still confidence in this newer generation, we'll call it, of leaders that are stepping into that space? That's again, a wonderful question. So diversity is real, okay? whether it's the more obvious things or it's the generational mindsets and the different things that they bring with them. And you always have to start with taking people where you find them. Leadership, you're serving a few different masters. The organization, frankly, primary and first. But get if you want to really help your team, the first thing is get very clear on what are your vital few and what your team is supposed to deliver, what a home run looks like, and then keep out as a leader stop the urgent many from betting you and causing those distractions. Let that stuff bounce off of you and keep them focused. So that's the first thing is, right, understand what it is that your purpose is as a leader in that organization, what your team is supposed to deliver and how you're going to be measured on that success. And so one of the things as a leader is you should be very clear on what a home run looks like. And then you translate that for your team and your team should ask you what a home run looks like. That's another, again, piece of advice I give myself if I was younger is go to your boss and ask them what a home run looks like, because that's very different than what they might've hired you to do, because that's based on a job posting. And you want to know, Hey, when we sit down and do my review in a year or whatever their process is, or we evaluate me after a year, even if that's not their normal process. And I did great. What is it? I did exactly. What did I deliver? And that's, so that's number one is be very clear on that because otherwise you're failing your team and they're going to get battered and bruised by other people pulling them into things that aren't value added. And you're going to be frustrated with why are you chasing that when we're, I told you it was this and all of that. And then give them, especially newer employees, like they don't have the skills and they don't even know that they can say no a lot of times. So they might get sucked into a project or an initiative or working like doing something and you're like, wait, what are you doing? And now all of a sudden they feel like, well, I'm in trouble. That's your fault. So Peter, you were supposed to start with day one explaining what are those vital few? What are we here to do? What does the home run look like? Here's how I'm going to get you up to speed. That's the servant leadership part of it, right? You're going to have to take time out of your busy schedule to help them become successful right out of the gate. And then you need to give them that. Here's what you do if this happens. We have a lot of things. Every organization moves at the speed of light. Every organization has too many initiatives. We are here to deliver X. If you are pulled into something that you know isn't going to really help you deliver X, then let's just talk about it. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be doing it, but you know this is what comes first. And I'm here to help you navigate those conversations. You don't necessarily have to say no. Sometimes that is above your pay grade, right? That is a discussion where I take my colleague out for a cup of coffee and say, oh, ain't no way. In the nicest way possible. Right. And then from there for leaders, I can't emphasize enough the importance of just really good cadence. 
and giving people a structure. And by that, I mean, if you're in the type of organization where you need to do one-on-ones weekly, then do them weekly and don't miss them. If it's less or it's more than that gap between then stick to that schedule, make them sacred times. And by the way, that should not be about you talking and talking. That should, a one-on-one should actually really just have a couple of questions. Tell me what you're working on. How are things going? What are your challenges? How can I support you? If you build that trust and they're able to come to you and talk to you about, I'm struggling working with this coworker. They talk over me in meetings. They They take credit for my work. They're not a good coworker. Like, how can you create that space where they could come to you with that and know that you can coach them appropriately on how do you deal with that? And really the more effective thing for that relationship down the line is to give them the skills and build their confidence and capability to go have that conversation with a coworker. Because you're going to get that coworker back down the road until you figure out how to deal with them in your career. That is something I can guarantee you. And then once you deal with them, you just get a different kind of problem coworker or boss or whatever. They would just repeat in your life until you you conquer them. Yeah. And so a couple of things that you said here that I definitely want to emphasize is that whole notion around being clear of what a home run looks like. I think back to my career in corporate and the times or the roles or departments that I struggled the most was where the leader had zero clarity and it was just like complete chaos at all. Yeah. Firefighters. Yeah. And (laughs) I remember a couple of times setting out right before performance review for one manager in particular, where I was just like, okay, what does success look like? What would you identify as the top three skills that I had like maybe three or four questions like prepared where I was really excited to have this conversation. And she came back with, as the leader, it's my responsibility to set the tone for how this conversation is going to go. And I was just like, yeah, this is not a good fit. (laughs) But if that is your stance, that you're not okay with someone getting clarification on what your expectations are, what success looks like, that that is a no-go. For those of you who are listening, I think that it's even important for those who are in entrepreneurship, right? When we bring on clients, let's ask them that question. What does a home run look like? What does success look like when we're done with this particular engagement? And I think that saves a lot of headache and a lot of mental turmoil. But then at the same time, it it makes things easier because you can always tie it back to, well, we said a home run looks like X. And Mm -hmm. this is what I believe is going to get us to the home run, or this is something that I feel is going to take us away from that. And so I, I love having that as the anchor. The other piece that you talked about, when it comes to organizations, and again, this is whether you are entrepreneur or in an organization, I have come to the assessment, right? And I know I'm generalizing that we as women, just because I, we have superpowers, I'll just say it. we were, God gave us superpowers, right? However, in certain environments, our superpowers almost create this illusion that we can actually do everything when we can. Wow. And so the example that you gave in terms of if you're trying to push something forward in a meeting and you're getting frustrated to go and to ask feedback, I think that's one But I also think that this other layer of asking for people to champion your your idea, asking for support. And I feel that is an area that if more of us even just did that, right? Like just ask for the support. The feedback is one thing, right? You'll figure out how to work through it. But then to just allow yourself to be vulnerable to say, hey, I need your help here. Or I need you to be my voice. Or I need you to do whatever. Has that been a thing that you've applied in terms of rallying people to champion your ideas and support you? And how have you seen that maybe not work so well for people? That's such a wonderful question again. So internally, I would say that's been more of a factor, right? I'm a solo printer. I don't have a whole bunch of people. Now I do sometimes I'll have a client who wants to advocate a certain way and I agree with them. And yes, we will collaborate. It, I call it the meeting before the meeting. Right? I don't think that's an original thought, but it's the meeting before the meeting. And so if you really do have something that you do need that, you know, that ally in the room, you need someone to help 
bolster your ideas, support them, then you do. You you go to your colleagues beforehand and you say, this is something that I'm going to be championing. Here's why. Do you support this? Do you have any thoughts? And if they're like, yeah, no, I can't say, okay. In the past, I've struggled a little bit when you know I go to say something and I, it feels like I just get run roughshod over. People don't always hear it. So if you can be that look for that opportunity, or would you be willing to do that? So you get that commitment before the meeting. It's a sophisticated strategy. It's not one I would, by the way, overuse. I think that there's a bank account in terms mm-hmm. of, and you have to be willing to be reciprocal in that too. So I wouldn't just approach anybody. I would approach like the smart strategic people and not just every random coworker with that. You got to careful who you align, your, align yourself with. They have to be aligned with how you see and you have to be willing to listen to if they're not. That's the other piece that sometimes yeah. I've had colleagues that just say, I hear you, you're tilting at a windmill. Honestly, like I've been here a long time and we've tried things like that before. And there's just, there's never any desire for that. So I admire you, but even if I did support you, like these things go to die, right? <laughs> these are ideas that are left to die on the vine and you'll be just dissociated with it. So don't recommend it. And sometimes then you have to take it back under advisement. Do you push forward? Do you not? These are not Googleable, clear answers, right? You have to make your own judgments um, about things. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing both sides of the coin there. And these are the fundamental things that like most of the time when we go to leadership trainings, I, heck, I do leadership development training, right? This is not the level of, granular detail that we're talking about. It stays very high level. It stays very surface. And we turn around and we wonder why, oh, we have a generation of people who don't know how to like just stand in their own identity of who they are or stand in whatever leadership authority they may have in a particular situation. So thank you for engaging me in this conversation of the just under the surface things that if we all just apply, that could really shift one, how we perceived ourselves and two, the impact that we were able to make in within the, those particular spheres of influence. I want to move into the, the blitz session here with the, the lessons that you've learned over a period of time. How do you define your leadership style and, or your philosophy? That's another great question. Philosophy and style. I'll start with style. I'm still a teller of truth. I've learned to soften the words. So I have learned to to tell the truth, but do it in a way that's supportive. So direct is good. It's much better than than not direct, but you can still soften Mm -hmm. that message. You can take your loyalty oath. My philosophy is that we're going to learn together. We're going to grow together. We're going to get a lot of stuff done but we're gonna have some fun, right? Yeah. That's that yeah, it, it shouldn't all be drudgery. Is there anything that you haven't covered that you've thought through that you're just like, oh my gosh, this is the one thing that might've been a game changer for me in my earlier formative years of, of my career? Yeah, I was always very sensitive. I was the employee that very early in my career, if you looked at me sideways, I would probably end up in the bathroom crying for a while. And I've come to just learn and embrace that part of myself. I'm an emotional person and a lot of women are, and we're dealing with a culture that isn't always appreciative that, you know, just because we're crying doesn't mean that we're like, there's something wrong with us. So I like to go back and tell myself, you're going to be okay. You know, that all of the stuff that, you know, is upsetting you now, you're actually going to be really grateful for these people probably actually have your back. The, the so-called constructive or negative feedback is actually probably some of the most positive things that will come out of your career and impact you. Yeah. I love that. That's what you would uh, tell your younger self to embrace that part of her. Two other questions for you. As you think about, or as I look at leadership and being effective, I am a firm believer that leaders are readers, right? And that we ought to be learning constantly because we can only lead our people to the extent in which we've grown. So are there, is there a book or a couple of books that have been pivotal for you in helping you to develop as a leader or become more effective as an entrepreneur? That's such, again, you ask really good questions. It's interesting. There's always 
some new thing out there. And I, it's not that I don't read, but I'm not fond of trends. And in the spirit of my vital few, I'm very selective about what I allow, I allow in, if that makes sense. So my reading mostly these days has been more focused in ensuring that I'm keeping up with the thinking on this new workforce and some of the trends and a lot of it honestly is garbage. I'm on the very beginning of the Gen X and I remember reading stuff back then about the boomers having fits about the Gen Xs and now I'm hearing about the millennials having fits about the next generation coming in. So yeah, I read more articles and and more things like that and then just try and sift through it and put it in perspective with the experience that that I have. And then I have some that I just go back to time and time again because they have had an impact on on how I think about my work and what I do. Yeah. So as we wrap up here, and thank you so much for this candid, rich conversation. So if members of the audience are thinking to themselves, like, I I need an Anne in my life, how can they get in contact with you? They can go to the website. LinkedIn's a great place to find me. I know there's a lot of Ann Sullivan's, but if you put HR in there, it'll definitely pop up. Okay, awesome. So we will include your website as well as your LinkedIn on there. And before we we wrap up here, any final thoughts, any anything that you want to leave for the audience? Uh, well, I think every day is a gift, right? And be open to where it takes you. I just wanted to say thank you for you. I, I love thought provoking conversations and questions and you're very skilled. I really appreciate that you, you asked really good questions. You forced me certainly to think about things in different ways. So I appreciate that. Oh, it's my pleasure. And this is similar to you with the background, 10 years of recruiting experience. Still with me, still with me. Gotta (laughs) love corporate. It's not for everyone, but definitely the training is, is, yeah, it's invaluable. So with that, and thank you so much for being on the show. For those of you listening, again, please check out the show notes to connect with Anne directly. If you had any ahas or anything that you are taking away from this, please feel free to share that with me. You can also always email me at support at sabinegideon.com. Would love to hear it. Until next week, have a fabulous week and we will chat next week. Take care. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of She Leads Now. If you found today's episode helpful or got a piece of insight that you plan to implement in your business or organization, I would love to hear from you. Connect with me on LinkedIn at Sabine Gideon, that's my handle, and send me a private message or feel free to go ahead and leave a review on either Apple or Spotify. I also invite you to share this episode with anyone in your network who you think might benefit from this content. Lastly, be sure to check the show notes and the description below for links to resources, including relevant downloads, articles, and any upcoming training. Until we chat again, have a blessed and powerful week.